By the dawn of the 1900s, the town of McPherson in central Kansas had grown to 3,000 residents. Agriculture was the primary economy, and surrounding farms supported many businesses in town, including flour mills and seed merchants. James Smalley owned a large seed warehouse next to the railroad tracks on North Main. His only child, Carl, had shown an early interest in art and was eager to attend college. Many boys had to drop out of school to work, but Carl was able to finish high school in 1904 along with four other boys and 12 girls. His collegiate hopes were dashed, however, when his father insisted he stay home and work in the family seed business. After working all summer as a traveling seed salesman, Carl was able to take a week off to visit the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, an extravaganza that had captivated not just the Midwest, but the entire world. Over seven months, nearly 20 million people traveled to St. Louis to see the latest inventions and other marvels, including a Ferris wheel so massive it could carry a thousand people at once. Coming from a town without a single paved road and little electricity, Carl was mesmerized. Formerly known as the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, the fair popularized Scott Joplin's ragtime music and introduced the X-ray machine, infant incubator, and personal automobile. 62 countries showcased their cultures through exhibits such as a Japanese tea house and an Egyptian marketplace complete with elephants. Statues, fountains, and waterfalls lined the walkways, while gondolas floated past domed palaces outlined with thousands of electric lights. Out of a sense of obligation, Carl surveyed the exhibits in the Palace of Agriculture, but his favorite by far was the Palace of Fine Arts, where he lost himself in a maze of elegant galleries displaying works by the best artists in the world. He spent countless hours there, wandering among the galleries and admiring sculptures in the landscaped courtyard and pavilion. Carl was especially taken with the etchings. He realized this method of making multiple prints from one plate or lithographic stone could make art more affordable. He was so enamored, he ordered a consignment of prints from a New York art dealer to be sent to his hometown. After the package arrived in McPherson, Carl convinced his father to let him display and sell the prints in the retail portion of the seed warehouse. While his father had to endure some ribbing from local farmers, the corner devoted to prints, pottery, and a few books won a small following. In another effort to make his seed salesman job tolerable, Carl decided to make the James Smalley & Company catalog more attractive. He added artful illustrations of produce and grains, and commissioned a talented young Bethany College student named C.A. Seward to design the cover. The local newspaper took note, running an article about the very beautiful cover, lithographed in trichromatic colors. The Smalleys and other business owners had long lobbied for a paved main street so that customers would not have to traverse a potentially muddy road. To celebrate the completion of North Main being paved with bricks, townspeople parked automobiles in front of James Smalley and company. That same year, a new high school opened in McPherson. Superintendent George Penny thought students should be exposed to art, so he organized an exhibition to raise funds to buy pictures for the walls. During a cold, rainy week in December 1911, townspeople braved the elements in their horses and wagons to see reproductions of famous works. Enough money was raised to buy two paintings, including one by Berger Sanzain, an art professor at Bethany College in nearby Lindsborg. The next year, the superintendent enlisted the help of the local young man who had been displaying art in his father's seed business. Carl Smalley loaned dozens of works from his personal collection, including two etchings by Whistler and a lithograph by the French artist Jean-Francois Millet. Enough money was raised to purchase a painting titled The Morning Letter by Harold C. Dunbar of Boston. That year, a Bethany student excitedly told her art professor about the collection of original art she had discovered in a seed warehouse. She introduced Professor Sanzane and Carl Smalley and a friendship quickly formed between the artist and art dealer. Berger Sanzane was 23 years old when he emigrated from Sweden in 1894. He had read about Swedish settlers founding a college in Kansas, and he applied for a teaching position there. After being accepted as a music and language faculty member, Berger immediately packed his belongings and set sail for America. He had been a serious art student in Stockholm and Paris, but the college was not in need of an art instructor at the time. The talented young artist was struck by the heightened colors of the western landscape as compared with the gray and blue pigments he had used in Sweden. 
He determined that the thinner air made colors appear more vivid and the shadows lighter. His palette became more vibrant and his strokes more vigorous, an attribute critics traced to one of his teachers, the famed Swedish artist Anders Zorn. A decade after arriving in Lindsborg, one of Berger's paintings was accepted for exhibition at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. Though the art dealer and the art professor lived only 12 miles apart and had similar interests, they did not meet until the year of the first school art exhibition in McPherson. Within a few years, Smalley was given full responsibility for organizing the week-long exhibition, and Sanzane's annual lecture drew standing room only crowds. The exhibits grew to fill every classroom in the high school with more than a hundred works of art, and students performed entertainment each evening in the auditorium. Admission was a nickel for students, a dime for adults, or 25 cents for the entire week. The classroom in the McPherson district that sold the most tickets won a prize of a print or sculpture. Each year, the coins added up to enough to purchase at least one painting or print for the schools, and Smalley advised the students in making astute selections. Artists so liked the idea of students being exposed to art that they cut their prices significantly for them. Sanzane often gave the students a second painting when they purchased one, and Oscar Jacobson, a juror for the St. Louis World's Fair, sold them the large canvas, A Prayer for Rain, for only $50. Smalley continued to loan pieces from his private collection as well as use his connections to secure loans from internationally known artists such as Joseph Pennell, who had won awards at prestigious Paris salons and the Grand Prix in Milan. Pennell was known for his lithographic depictions of engineering marvels such as the Panama Canal and Brooklyn Bridge. Smalley's extensive personal collection of prints was also a highlight of Sunday dinners at the Sanzane home. The family eagerly awaited Carl's visits to see what was in his portfolio that week. Smalley believed his friend to be one of the best landscape artists in the country, and he had long encouraged Sanzane to try lithography, but to no avail. Finally, Smalley bought the supplies himself and insisted Sanzane try the technique. Sanzane's first lithograph, Colorado Pines, was such a success that he went on to create more than 300 lithographs, block prints, and dry points. Sanzane presented the first two prints as gifts to the McPherson High School class of 1916. Smalley sent the first lithographs to Joseph Pennell, who praised them and requested prints to display in London. While Carl's art corner in the warehouse had attracted a following, the seed business floundered after his father suffered a fall that left him physically and mentally impaired. Carl had to assume responsibility for the seed company, which he found to be insolvent. After his father died in 1918, Carl sold the inventory to a local feed and seed company. It took Carl 10 years to pay off the seed company's debts. Carl moved his prints, pottery, and books from the seed warehouse down the block and opened his own storefront. He created an inviting space where he sold not just fine art and pottery, but exotic gifts such as fine Italian stationery, Chinese mahjong sets, and brass incense burners from India. The farming community was drawn to his artful selection of Japanese tea sets, greeting cards, quill pens, Tiffany glass, and first edition books. His selection of books grew to cover several shelves. The shop became a popular meeting place, and some proclaimed it to be the finest such store between Chicago and Denver. Freed from the seed store responsibility, Smalley was able to focus more on art, and the local exhibitions grew in notoriety. When he secured an original etching by Rembrandt for the 1920 exhibition, it made not just the front page in the county's newspapers, but in Kansas City as well. A few years later, Robert Henri, one of the most acclaimed contemporary artists, agreed to send a painting to exhibit in the small Kansas town. Smalley wrote an Arts Notes column in the local newspaper about the latest in art news and to educate readers about printmaking. He helped students acquire works by such masters of printmaking as James Abbott McNeil Whistler, Anders Zorn, Joseph Pennell, Sir Francis Seymour Hayden, and Alan McNabb. Excitement built throughout the year as townspeople speculated what artists Smalley would secure for that year's show. They also eagerly looked forward to seeing Sanzane's latest works and hearing his lecture. As many as half of the town's 5,000 residents attended the week of art, lectures, and music. News of this small Kansas town's passion for art reached the New York and Paris offices of International Studio. In 1923, the magazine published an article about the Führer for Art that Carl Smalley had created on the Kansas Plains and proclaimed that McPherson residents must own more art per capita than anywhere in the world. 
The magazine called Smalley the world's greatest art dealer and told of farm wives saving egg money and children saving their allowance to buy original art. Smalley is quoted as saying his dream was to put art on the walls of every schoolhouse in Kansas. The McPherson exhibitions flourished during the 1920s, attracting works by artists who had studied at Le Col de Beaux-Arts and exhibited in the prestigious Paris salons. Proceeds from exhibitions allowed students to purchase a landscape painting by Albert Crable, who had won some of Europe's top prizes, and a portrait by Lee Green Richards, the only American to serve as a juror for the 1921 Autumn Salon in Paris. While Smalley represented many artists, he poured the majority of his promotion efforts into Sanzane's work, printing catalogues of his art and organizing traveling exhibitions. Smalley also printed and sold note cards and Christmas cards featuring Sanzane's art. William Allen White, the famed Emporia editor and Pulitzer Prize winner, was a patron of the art and bookstore in McPherson and agreed to write an introduction to a book of Sanzane's lithographs that Smalley wanted to publish. For the introduction to In the Mountains, White wrote, Berger Sanzane knows that mood of nature. He goes to it unafraid and comes back triumphant, capturing it, subduing it, translating it into human terms. Sanzane's reputation continued to grow and he was invited to send paintings to prestigious exhibitions in New York, Paris, Rome, Florence, Venice, and Stockholm. Smalley's business was going so well he opened a second shop in Kansas City. In 1930, a group of noted artists met at Sanzane's studio to form the Prairie Printmakers. Smalley was invited to join as an honorary founding member. Organizing the group was the idea of C.A. Seward, the young Bethany student Smalley had commissioned 20 years earlier to design the cover of the seed catalog. By then, the stock market had crashed and the Great Depression had descended. McPherson County was somewhat spared because of the surrounding oil boom, but downtown rents increased and patrons began to cut back on art purchases. Smalley and Sanzane both cut prices in an effort to bolster sales. When the dust storms hit the Midwest and crippled farm incomes, it was too much for Smalley to weather, and he made the difficult decision to close his shop in 1934. He and his wife, who was pregnant at the time, left Kansas for California, where Carl worked as a publisher's representative. When Carl Smalley left McPherson, the school's permanent art collection was ranked the second largest in the United States with 130 pieces of original art. The school's exhibitions ended a few years later. Smalley's legacy can still be seen in businesses, schools, museums, public buildings, and countless homes in Kansas.